to a hold of you that any support of hybridization will give legitimacy to the colonial violence that created it in the first place. Notwithstanding the caution implied in these observations, the challenge to find a balance between difference and sameness, the local and the global, is one that must be pursued if Anglicanism is to be received as the liberating voice of the gospel message. Caribbean scholars have put forward the theory that the experience of colonization and slavery was never a one-way encounter as it allowed the slaves to develop new discourses of meaning that incorporated both the experiences of the master and that of the African roots. Edward Brathwaite, for example, in his early work on Jamaica as a Creole society, emphasizes the survival even under the most potent oppression of the distinctive aspects of the culture of the African slave. He writes, and allow me, it's a longish quote, quote what he said. Even more important for an understanding of Jamaican development during this period was the process of creolization, which is a way of seeing the society not in terms of white and black, master and slave, in separate nuclear units, but as a contributory part of a whole. To see Jamaica, or the West Indies generally, as a slave society is as much a falsification of reality as the scene of the island as a naval station or as an enormous sugar factory. Here in Jamaica, fixed with the dehumanizing institution of slavery, we are two cultures of people having to adapt themselves to a new environment and to each other. The friction created by this was cruel, but it was also creative. I go on in this in this lecture, and I will I will I will omit. Um, some of the references, but there are other scholars like, like Michael Dash who hold the same kind of position. And, and in fact, the Anglican Church, because of its hybrid nature, is sociologically placed to create that kind of out of many oneness that a Creole society. In the case of, of Brathwaite, he was pretty disappointed because the white planters did not, in fact, embrace the vision of creating a true Creole society within the Caribbean. The idea of hybridization and creolization, therefore, must be taken seriously by the CPWI, and I've given two reasons for this. Because in the first place, both hybridization and creolization describe fully the inner creative response of a displaced people to the brutal consequences of slavery and colonialism, and what led to the creative experience of Caribbean culture, expressed in our attitudes or values and in our patterns of belief. Out of this cultural hybridity emerged an indigenous, in, indigenous religion, like for example, the Rastafarians. Say what you wish about the role of indigenous religions. They provided the former colonized and now marginalized people of the Caribbean with a place where their identity can be affirmed. Cartwright Davis and Noel Erskine, two Caribbean theologians serving in North America, argue that Caribbean churches have done very little to change the symbols in our worship. And therefore, the image people have 
of the God they serve. I quote, Nothing that the people say and, and her bore any relationship to how they live. Thus, there was a radical discontinuity between what was sacred and blessed by the churches and what was indigenous to the people. So many may argue that changes did take place when the governance structure of our local churches was no longer controlled from the missionary headquarters. In fairness, most Christian denominations, even those that were established as part of the hegemonic design of Europe, have since the 1960s made deliberate effort to shed their foreignness and to embrace a prophetic witness that is relevant to Caribbean people. The point is, much more needs to be done in developing a Caribbean Christian identity as well as a theological and biblical hermeneutics that can help to inform and promote that identity. So let me say something about theology and context, and I try to do that in some reform. See, theology is always challenged by finding a balance between the universal and the local. That means understanding the various cultural contexts in which the gospel must be proclaimed in word and deed. The refusal of the Jewish Christian Paul to submit to the Gentile Christian to circumcision as found in Acts chapter 15 is an expression of this acknowledgement of the other. As the gospel moved from Jerusalem to Athens, Paul had to account for the alternative knowledge system Christianity encountered in Greek culture. This acknowledgement of the stranger is a quality that characterized Jesus' own ministry as reflected in many of his parables. The question is, what led to the suspicion of those hermeneutical tools of Paul and of Jesus that so clearly affirmed the compassionate acceptance of the stranger by the one who is culturally different. When the church began equating the universal mission entrusted to it with the kingdom of God, it began adopting a hermeneutics of assimilation. That is to say, the universality of the message became a major feature in silencing the possibility of the local culture to sing the Lord's song in its own language. Today, there are signs of new consciousness emerging in the theology of mission. An example of this <coughs> was demonstrated over a decade ago by the Mission Commission of the Anglican Communion in their report to the Anglican Consultative Council meeting in Edinburgh, Scotland, in September 1999. While acknowledging the fundamental unity of the gospel, the commission rejected any idea that should mean the colonization of difference within the local culture. All mission, the report stated, is done in a particular setting, that is the context. So although there is a fundamental unity to the good news, it is shaped by the great diversity of places, times, and cultures in which we live, proclaim, and embody. Theologians in a post-colonial culture are affirmed by these developments and began embracing the same rules as those observed by Paul, who demonstrated inclusiveness on matters pertaining to customs, that are merely peripheral to core, core belief. Once the claim to universality becomes theologically and politically dysfunctional, new horizons of knowledge must be sought.
I go on to, to look at the whole matter of tradition and whether in fact tradition is something that is is more of an adjective than a noun because it functions in a way that that engages people and ultimately must be a moving target. I use, I make reference to Professor Christopher Durasing, for example. He then demonstrates something of that process when he wrote, until and unless through a series of cross-cultural conversation and the use of a critical hermeneutics of difference. The diverse cultural expressions of the Christian story everywhere are received as central elements in the traditioning process. We will not be liberated from a past which remains essentially European, nor can we receive the stories of the good news in Christ in every new and multifaceted ways relevant to our times. Durasing's use of the word traditioning is deliberate as it is an attempt to rediscover the dynamic process of handing down the story of God's presence in Christ. As the story is handed down to different peoples and as people witness to this apostolic dynamic the meaning of the story received in its fullness. The fullness of the Christian story that is continually built up through the ever-moving traditioning process. A new Catholic experience now emerges. There are four priorities for a renewed commitment to Anglicanism's future witness to the church in the province of the West Indies, which I'd just like briefly to share with you in my conclusion. First of all, our theological institutions, namely Codrington College and the United Theological College, must be prepared to engage in serious dialogue with social scientists and professionals in other disciplines. For example, critical social theory has proven to be a worthy companion to theology, thereby contributing significantly to its prophetic imagination. It can equally serve Caribbean theology well. When the, Christ, when the church lives with the notion of a Inevitability, inevitability of history. It is not likely to do anything to facilitate change. Scholars like Hegel and Marx perceive history differently. They claim within the eye of history lay a whirlwind of social contradictions and struggle. We know that from our own experience. And it is to these social contradictions that the Old Testament prophets spoke and to which the gospel of Christ urges us to speak today. The gospel itself cannot liberate systems of injustice that have been eroding the moral and social fabric of the society for decades. For that to happen, Christian men and women will have to engage the gospel in dialogue with other partners. William Temple, a former Archbishop of Canterbury, would insist that one cannot hope to pray authentically unless he or she has the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. This is precisely so because theology is public theology. Today Christians must be encouraged to read the Bible with a critical eye for justice and that must mean paying attention to our social scientists and commentators who can help us to ask the deep questions that occupy the mind and hearts of our people. The well-being of our country involves not just the development of the physical infrastructure, but the measure by which the society is able to guarantee some reasonable standards of living for its members. 
when that possibility is disabled by the imposed conditionalities of lending institutions, including our local banks, then the entire well-being of the people is undermined. Theology must assist the ordinary reader of scripture to interrogate the important issues of the day and in the name of justice speak the truth to power. Secondly, we must develop new ways of reading the Bible. Reading the Bible in a manner that gives life to the text and correspondingly allows the reader to find their own life story in the text. That must be the aim of every Christian. For new and liberating stories for our lives can indeed emerge from the Bible once we are prepared to place ourselves within the text and ask questions such as who speaks for whom? Who is given voice and who is silenced? One cannot successfully answer those questions unless you pay attention to the social setting or the context in which we live out our faith. The collective memory of the local culture as well as one's social experience in our everyday life unavoidably possess those questions, poses those questions to the text. Because of our largely privileged place within the society, it is perhaps hard for Anglicans to recognize that often it is the people outside of the church of the status quo who daily contemplate the possibility of their own emancipation. They are the very ones who ask the kind of penetrating questions that the psalmist often asks. Questions like, where is God? Why has God not liberated us? Why is the church so silent <coughs> on issues of injustice? In whose interest does democracy serve? These questions invite the church into new areas of social engagement and demand a reassessment of the way it does theology. The challenge to find a theology for social transformation is not a call for the church to produce more theologies from the top. There are already many in existence. The challenge is to re-examine the way the Bible has been read and interpreted in the past and to open up the discourse to include the voices of resistance that have felt excluded from the historic hermeneutical process. Caribbean theology can draw on the experience of Latin America and Southern African Christians who have long developed the technique of reading the Bible from the perspective of the poor. This reading of the Bible from our side, I must add, goes beyond a mere translation of the text into Jamaican patois. What in some theological circles would be termed the indigenization of the text? Writing from the South African context, Archbishop Ndungari states, and I quote, the major weakness of this approach towards indigenization is that it sought to dress Christianity in African culture while maintaining its foreignness in terms of symbols, thought forms, and value systems. In practice, this implied the adaptation of European practices and thought patterns to the cultural life of the people of Africa. Scripture became a tool of domination in the sense that African Christians could not escape the colonial models of being Christian. All models of Christianity came from outside rather than inside Africa. The approach was to maintain the status quo even though the model was used by the African theologians themselves. Oppression through colonial domination had been internalized. Models of being church remain hierarchical and colonial. End of quote. The third area 
that requires urgent attention for our further witness must be that of addressing the distorted self-image that Caribbean people have of themselves. Like all colonized people, Caribbean people have had to struggle with an image of the self that is mirrored by the approval or disapproval of the colonizer. Such false consciousness frequently produces in opposition people have uh, in, in, in sorry in oppressed people a vehement self-loathing for failing to live up to an ideology's norm and ideals for failing to achieve it is for this reason why liberation theology places an emphasis on the marginalized and the non-person as a center of theological dialogue and so those of us who are part of the mainstream of society and occupy leadership in our congregations must take seriously the idea of privilege when considering a theology that is in solidarity with the struggles of the poor Sharon Welch makes a very valid point when she observed that the temptation to despair and so give up on any idea that society can change takes on a peculiar meaning for the middle class. Not that the poor are immune from despair and cynicism, but the despair of the affluent, the despair of the middle class has a particular tone. It is easier to give up on long-term social change when one is comfortable in the present, when one has options, it is despair cushioned by privilege and grounded in privilege. And I should add entitlement. These words strike at the heart of the difficulty in moving forward with a theological narrative <coughs> that gives priority to the struggle of a people. It is not sufficient to know what is wrong with the social order. We must know the extent to which we benefit from having things remain as they are. Until Anglican leaders are willing to claim our own social location, we will never be able to acknowledge our own complicity with a system that makes one group benefit to the disadvantage of others. Making that acknowledgement would be a major first step in working towards a theological hermeneutic that would be socially transforming for Caribbean society. And this leads to the fourth area of priority for Anglicanism's further witness in these Caribbean lands. This is to say, a willingness to embrace our social and cultural context as a medium through which the gospel is communicated and received. This sounds so basic, it hardly needs repeating. And yet, the fact is, because the one sharing the same goals, sharing the message is often from a different place, and likely does not share the same goals as a listener. Different conclusions are drawn from the communicated event. Take, for example, the base ecclesia communities in Latin America and South Africa. Their emphasis is given to the receiver of the message and not to the speaker. In, the, in Bible study, for example, the critical question is not what the text says, but what the text means for the reader. As a result, local people are constructing their own theology. On the other hand, the one sharing the story is often preoccupied with the integrity of the message, while the hearer has a preoccupation with identity, context, and what is taking place in his or her life at the moment. 
if Caribbean theology is to affirm context, then it must be willing to embrace a dialogue with and within the culture and the context as a basic methodological tools. If we believe that God continues God's work outside the visible church, then Caribbean theology cannot ignore what Idris Hammond calls the many non-church ways in which the reality of God is communicated, experienced and expressed in our culture. These non-church ways make up who and what we are as Caribbean people. Indigenous religions like Rastafarianism long discovered this, and because of this, they have been able to capture the imagination of the people. Would that the mainline churches of the Caribbean could place their scholarly tradition to the service of that endeavor. The prospects of that happening awaits us. Despite the perception of many that Anglican identity remains a mirror of the colonial enterprise, and despite there have been moments when the Anglican church kept itself aloof from the Caribbean cultural zone within which it functions, it nevertheless possesses the gifts that must complete the unfinished task of devising a mission a missiology free from the hegemonic categories that have informed the way we read scripture and live out the gospel. Lamin Sane, an African theologian, in his book Translating the Message, argues that despite the prominence of hierarchical structures and its complicity with colonialism. Christianity affirmed the local culture as a worthy medium for the transmission of the message of the true and living God. The very success of Christianity during the first centuries of its existence was because of its effective translation from one culture into another so that it could become identified with its new location. This was affirmed at the Triennial Synod of the Church in the Province of the West Indies, held in Barbados in 2015. Dr. Anna Perkins, in addressing the Synod, suggested that the Anglican Church in the Caribbean has been gifted with a strange kind of obligation. Strange? Because notwithstanding our colonial legacy, Caribbean people are assured of the presence and engagement of the Anglican Church in their lives. Indeed, the Church continues to be the center of life in many villages and rural communities across the region. The priests and members of the vestry are respected and relied on for many things. Educational institutions, continue to be a key means of serving the people in the region. This is because the gifted presence of the church in the province of the West Indies is far from passive. Caribbean Anglicans recognize the relationship between their presence, the presence of others, and the real presence of Christ lay there in the Eucharist. Such engagement is a public sign of the church's commitment to the well-being of the world and the discovery of the kingdom in the midst of the places where we are all present. Anglicans can't help but be engaged within the life of the community because built within Anglican self-understanding are the theological tools necessary to promote the kind of transformation that is urgently needed in our region and for which I am advocating. So, in the furthering of the witness of Anglicanism in our region, our most urgent and important imperative must be consistent with our commitment to demonstrate in multiple and creative ways that the will of God is being, bringing life to all and to bring it in all of its fullness 
in every aspect of our society. That is the commitment that shaped the ministry and work of our beloved Archbishop Gomez. Ours is the task to recommit ourselves to finding a theological model that is open to the full participation of everyone within the interpretive process of hearing what God is saying through scripture in these our Caribbean islands. When Christian mission becomes open to such a witness through the movement of the Spirit of Christ, all are transformed and enriched. Archbishop Gomez, Carol, may continue, God continue to bless you in your ministry because indeed the work is not yet finished. Bless you. Bishop Thompson has agreed to entertain a few questions from the audience. So we we'll invite you all, please, to come up, make it brief, and then we will continue uh, with the rest of the program for this evening. I think we've all been impacted by the four priorities that he has set for us in terms of the theological institutions within our Caribbean setting that go far beyond just the two major theological schools. There are other institutes that are scattered throughout the entire province who are impacting our people in so many ways. I think we are struggling against the huge tide of people trying to interpret the scriptures, especially when you're dealing with that of the satellite age. Um, addressing our self-image, what is good and positive, it almost seems as though because we are Caribbean people, we have to do it far more better for it to be uh, received by other persons. And the last point that he talked about, a willingness to embrace Social and, uh, social and cultural context so that we're able to make a necessary blend. Um, Bishop, I want to ask a question just to get the questions going. Um, normally when I talk about us in the Caribbean, I talk about a blending that takes place. We are made up of so many cultures, so many peoples, so many religions. Are we to embrace that as a sort of blending of the way forward so that we're able to allow Anglicanism to be broad enough to incorporate much of what we see around us? Because I think some people are terrified of seeing any kind of change, terrified of anybody uh, altering even the words in the prayer book or changing the order of the Mass. Um, just want you to comment on it, please. I understand blending in the sense can that you mentioned there as different from homogenizing. Um, and sometimes when we speak about um, blending and bringing together a society that yes, 
have multiple voices and multiple differences is at some point there is a cost that is involved and the more dominant voice is the one that assumes what the rules of that engagement will be. Now we had a synod, as Bishop Gregory, if you recall, um, I think it was the 2020 synod which had to be postponed because of COVID. And, and I was tasked, if you recall, to make contact with a dance hall artist <laughs> who could actually come and dialogue <coughs> with, with Anglican voices, theologically. And I must share with you, there was one person who, who I thought would have, I mean, he's a university graduate, and I think he had the language and the skill sets to participate in that. And his agent would not allow him to have that conversation with the church. And I suspect because she felt that something would be lost in the process. And so what has happened with many of our societies, here in the Bahamas, but I know in Jamaica, is that we, we are shouting at one another and we are really not engaging. Because there is a fear that by doing that, something is going to be lost in the process. We are about, we are celebrating this year, the 60th anniversary of our independence. Our national motto is, out of many, one people. And it's sad to say that we are at a point when we, we have to critically look at that because we are, the creolization that I spoke of in my paper, we, we have really failed because we are, we, are, we are not prepared as a society really to engage with each other, not in a, an homogenous way where everybody will lose what they bring into the relationship, but that we acknowledge indeed that we are many, we are different, and in that difference we can find our oneness. That's a challenge. And I do feel, as I have said, because of the very nature of Anglicanism, founded and established on the basis of those differences, that we have within us the tools to promote a oneness without being homogenized. Thompson, just a question now. I'm asking if you can please expound or just explain a bit more about hybridization and creolization um, from your paper. Uh, how we can, um, I guess, use it how uh, in our context. Well, well you know, the, the um Yeah, Bishop Sierra and Archdeacons, and they could probably speak a little bit more to on the whole matter of, of um, the via media within the Anglican Church, which really created us, establishing the Elizabethan settlement. So we had, you know, we, we think about the Anglican communion now and the, and the conflicts and the differences, but let's go back to the, to the 17th and 18th century in terms of how the Anglican Church struggled with, with the various arms of, of, of its Catholic and Protestant and Evangelical area. And, you know, quite frankly, I think for a long time the Church of England, it may be suffering a little bit now in, in holding things together, but for a long time the Church of England was able to maintain the, the hybrid nature of its of its of its origin, um, the difference in terms of uh, the the 
the values and the meanings that shape our lives. Uh, it's there. And, and we felt that, as I made reference to, to um, Professor Prathway in terms of his, his concept of creolization, his belief, really, was that they, and taking the Jamaican society, that the white population was the one who did not fulfill their side of the bargain in terms of his own vision of creolization. Yes, there were intermarriages at some point, but later on that that didn't hold together. And, and I could give I could give strong examples. Uh, when when my predecessor at St. Andrew Parish Church became the first black rector. Many of the white membership of the church um, just simply migrated. They either left the church completely or some, one who remains a friend of mine today, went and established the Grace Missionary Church not too far away. <laughs> And, and you still find that that, that that struggle continues where they don't feel comfortable to be present, to, to, to be in fellowship with you. Um, and I can only speak of the Jamaican context. Um, there are homes in which Charmin and I, as two black persons, leaders within the community, will be welcome. But the only other blacks that would be present in that whole world of function would be the servants. Um, now, this is not something that we, we highlight or talk about in the society, but it is there and it glares you in the face. So, the whole matter of a Creole society, as, as um, Eddie Bradway had spoken of and, and written of, uh, didn't ar didn't arrive, and the vision of of our national motto out of many one is is still something that that is eluding us as a society. concern that I have now that swirls around in my head often is the whole <clears throat> degree of what I would call optionality of God in our midst where even though we have all of this wonderful stuff and as Anglicans we can be really entrenched in a lot of it that we're doing we feel sometimes I feel sometimes that given our existential predicament in this day and age and given some of the other concerns in our world, people have somehow chosen or not chosen or optioned out God in a lot of their choosing. How do we as church and how do you see us, I don't want to say enticing, but how do we again make appealing this church and its message and how do we ensure that Anglicanism as it is, become that thing that speaks to this overall uh, optionalization, I would say, of God. Uh, just so that God can once again be seen relevant. I think a lot of what was said here, if not all, very rich, very good stuff. If this was a bowl, it would be a lovely bowl of food, but um, <laughs> sometimes we don't get people to come to the table to taste it, to taste it. So how do we, how do you see the, the overall optionality of God as a concern by myself? I think, I think, I 
you may have to take a lot of responsibility for that <laughs> in terms of how people perceive us and perceive the church. Going back to the story that I told of that, of that visitor to the Kingston Parish Church, um, the, the, there is something that will draw us, I say us, putting myself in the place of that woman, um, to the to the Anglican Church, but if sometimes the very thing that draws us there is what also repels us. Um, so we have to to critique ourselves and look at the image that we portray of ourselves of God, because people are seeing and perceiving God through us and through our work. Um, yes, it's a bit hard because when you are when you are perceived as part of the establishment of, of which we are and we have to accept that it's, it's now our responsibility to do the kind of um, self-critique that I've re recommended in the paper and in fact I, I will be handing the paper to His Grace the Archbishop and to the Diocese of Bishop and if, if they choose to have it circulated to, um, to the clergy um, sure, I would be very, very happy to do that. Um, my wife doesn't like when I stand up and speak too long, so so I I, I had to I, I had to do some some surgical work while I was while I was proceeding because I got the impression that I I, I know it's a lecture, it's not a sermon, so you you are here to be attentive, and I thank you for that. But, um, but I, I, I didn't want to abuse you too much. So I've, I've had to reduce what, what I prepared, but I, I will leave that with the Irish. Bishop, as someone who has had the opportunity to go to so many of the dioceses within our province, um, this journey has really been enriched by certain experiences. You, the present Archbishop, our retired Archbishop, I remember in 2000 we had the Anglican Congress and we spent so much time together and it provided bishops, priests, deacons, people from across the province to gather together to, to, to really share experiences so that they could strengthen the entire church. When you mentioned the Kingston Church, I, I never forget my experience in that church on that Sunday afternoon at the closing service. We had a moving experience in that place. And I really believe that it's not just the worshiping together as the Caribbean people, but I think as part of the priority within our province to help people, because some of us are a little further on this road um, than some of us who are just probably getting started. And I believe that part of your priority should be to bring us back together again. I'm still waiting for the day when we could have that experience where as Caribbean people we can get together and share our entire story. Um, I find in my trips to Jamaica practically every year um, since 2000 that there have always been moments of enrichment for me and helping me to to find my way and, and discover something new that I could bring back. And I want to thank the Diocese of Jamaica for that. Please give them a big round of applause. Because they've been, their healing conferences have been really meaningful to me. And I think that's the reason why we got them started here in the Bahamas. I believe that this is a grand opportunity to add to that priority list our togetherness. Because 
we can't do this by ourselves. We need the help of each other to get where God wants us to go. We will now ask Father Enrique McCartney to come to give us the vote of thanks. It is an honor to offer a vote of thanks on this occasion of the Golden Jubilee Lecture on the 50th anniversary of the consecration of Archbishop Gomez in our St. John's College facility. On behalf of our Dawson Bishop, Bishop Leish Boyd, our dear Archbishop Drexel Gomez and the entire Dawson family, I wish to thank you, Bishop Robert Thompson. I'm very grateful to you, Bishop Thompson, for sharing your insightful words with us in today's lecture. I must remark a proficient sense of gratefulness for your guiding us into a deeper knowledge of idealism. I'm sure that all the participants of this meeting were inspired, as I have been, by your highly meaningful words on the future of the church and our theological and spiritual road ahead. This was, to me, an outline of a roadmap, not only for our province, but for our communion in general. Contemporary issues, social setting, context, culture, our own distinct traditions and more are indeed all factors to consider for all Anglicans, especially those who reflect upon theology. This is necessary to uplift the despondent and the marginalized and those who are not in any way privileged. And always filter our messages through very relevant contextual lenses which are necessary and appropriate that apply to those whom, to whom we minister. And so, let me thank you, Bishop Thompson, and I thank each and every one of you who have participated in this lecture in any area. And I say God bless you. And thank you for finding the time to come in fellowship with us today. I hope you have been fed and that you have grown closer to God. And as you leave here, let the love of God be with you and the grace of God be upon your life until we meet again. God bless you all and all God's people. I will just ask you to please stand so we can receive his grace. <coughs> the Most Reverend Drexel Wellington Gomez, who will come to give brief remarks and a benediction. I first met Bishop Thompson when I was bishop in Barbados and he was, I think in his final year at UTC, he came to Barbados with a friend who was a fellow colleague at UTC, Anthony Jemmert, who was a Barbadian ordinary and studying at not at Codrington, but studying at UTC. And 
we had the privilege of having Robert as our guest at Bishop's Court. And that was the beginning of a friendship that has lasted for many, many years. And which we, Carol and I, have cherished. And I've had the opportunity of sharing fellowship at their residence in Jamaica on, I suppose, more occasions than Charmaine wishes to remember. <laughs> It has always been a privilege, and we have enjoyed that relationship. Uh, I know you all want to get home, so I'll be very, I promise to be very brief. <laughs> and I want to thank Robert for uh, helping us who are interested in the understanding of Anglicanism and also of appreciation, the challenge that we have as Anglicans to not only understand our identity and who we are, but also cherishing it and working to see to it that it continues under God's grace and guidance for the future. I'm reminded of what a saying that Father Rule would like very much because he likes saying Latin. <laughs> we, we are, as the saying is, in via sed non in patria. We are on the journey in Via, but we haven't yet arrived at the homeland. But we as Anglicans are on that journey in which we are seeking to be faithful to the God who calls us and who commissions us to proclaim his gospel and to live it. Because so often the proclamation of his gospel has simply been proclamation and there hasn't been much effort in living it, in incarnating it in the lives and interactions of uh, the persons who claim to be part of the proclamation, either those proclaiming or those who are receiving it. But I thought that Robert's lecture tonight challenges us as something that I first encountered as a statement uh, my father, Richard Borkham, who was a famous Anglican theologian, who was, for most of his ministry, was at Cambridge. But in one of his earlier writings, he said that we had the challenge of communicating the gospel as something that is a given, but we can only interpret it if we understand and appreciate the context in which it has been given. That to really proclaim the gospel, you have to be able to be, not only know who the people are, to know the context, as like Mr. Thompson mentioned so often, to know the context, but you have to know the situations, the people, the culture, in the culture, the circumstances. If you, if you don't have that knowledge of where you are, what you are about, then you can't really receive the gospel. You have, and certainly you can't really proclaim it. And so part of our exercise has to be taking our context seriously. We all are aware of the fact that colonialism never attempted to do that. Uh, colonialism imposed a reality and the structures upon us, never took us seriously. And if we are to really appreciate what God is trying to do with us and to us, we have to pay more attention to our context. And as a church, our pattern has, tried, has attempted to be taking what we have received and passing it on, but not stopping to see how this is being received and what it is saying about who we are and what our culture and what our realities really are. Some years ago I read a commentary on the parable of the prodigal son, or the, really the parable of the man who had two sons. And uh, the whole commentary was showing how the message of the parable is received in different ways. And what struck me, but one of the 
rather the, 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 the writer of the commentary is saying he had spoken to people in several different contexts. Uh, there were some who focused on the father and his tremendous overcoming love, some who focused on the repentant son, and then some who focused on the elder brother who refused to be involved. And, and who, so they saw in all of these persons projections of how we live in the church. But there was one African group that commented on the gospel, on the parable of the in a totally unexpected way for me. The leader of this group said the thing for her, it's a woman making the presentation, she said, the thing for her about the parable was, in these words, no one gave him anything. That is, when the son who had wasted his, the substance of the father's gift, when all of that, when he was alone and among those who had nothing, the marginalized and the underprivileged. No one gave him anything. And she saw, she said that for her the gospel enabled her to transcend her reality because she lived in a community in which that was the prevailing attitude of the community. People were selfish and only concerned about it. So they weren't concerned about what was happening to other people. And so she could identify with this young man, not so much with his sinfulness, his behavior, but the fact that in his position, no one paid attention to him. And when we are engaging our context and understanding our realities, we will take each member and uh, pay attention to each member member and also be more uh, responsive to the situations in which we live and uh, not to be so judgmental as the older brother was and all of these various negativities exist in our culture and if the gospel is to really be transformative in the context we must be holistic and Anglicanism to me as uh, I think Robert gave a good picture of that, is that the ingredients of Anglicanism are the ingredients I believe that God wants to use for bringing the, the world to the place where God wants it to become. Unity, diversity and synthesis are what we as Anglicans represent. Uh, as a response to our, the ecclesial situation in England, that's where it started. Uh, uh, we have attempted to bring those three entities together and we are still in the search of the synthesis. But we do honor that they, God wishes us to become one. The prayer of Jesus, you know, that, that we are to become one as Jesus and the Father are one. That is the unity that he is calling us to. There is the diversity which Anglicans take very seriously. And, uh, but living in diversity is never easy. It calls for compassion and comport, consideration of the other, uh, valuing and respecting the other even when you don't agree, but accepting diversity and accepting the challenge of trying to find a synthesis empathizing and being patient and being tolerant and respecting the views of others. All of these factors, uh, if you take diversity seriously and are in search of the synthesis, you are willing to engage. My reflection on the church of the Carib in the Caribbean, uh, the province of the West Indies, is that we have been too content with simply calling people to go to church and engage in worship. We have tried to emphasize ethics and living in community, but our emphasis has really been, I think, too much, not just on worship, because I don't think it's possible to overemphasize worship, but the concept of being a member of a body that causes us to come together and to really work at understanding who we, who we are, owning up to who we are, and accepting the challenge to do something about transformation, 
enabling us to move from where we are to that better place that the gospel calls us to occupy. And so I believe that we have much work to do in our province in terms of creating a more relevant the theological synthesis and to work at it and not just to be content with simply keeping church. And I would, risk, I would say that for many, many parishes in our province, we have an overemphasis on keeping church. And we must accept a wider call and the willingness to engage in it. And to, I would conclude with my Latin thing I gave for Father Rule that we are on the journey. We are in via. By the grace of God, we will arrive at our patria to be with him in his everlasting abode in the new Jerusalem where we will see him face to face and enjoy that presence for all eternity. Good night. Could you please stand for the blessing? The Lord be with you. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God the Holy Trinity bring us together in faith and love and truth. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us this night and evermore. Amen. Amen. And get home safely, please. Yes. You sing the last hymn. Yes. Lord of grace and God of glory, on thy people for thy power, now fulfill thy church's story.